Hey, it's Greg Stanley. If you're listening to this podcast, you know I love everything automotive. This passion has expanded to include being a car specialist consultant for RM Sotheby's. So if you need assistance buying or consigning a collector car at any one of our online or live auctions, including Scottsdale, Amelia Island, or Monterey, you can reach one of our car specialists at rmsotheby's.com or you can email me directly at gstanley at rmsotheby's.com. This is the Collector Car Podcast, the home for the auto enthusiast. Join Greg Stanley as he applies over 25 years of insights and analytical experience to the collector car market. He will interview the experts and throw in some fun stuff as well. Well, welcome to the Collector Car Podcast. Happy New Year, everyone. And before we move on to 2021, I would like to take a moment and look back on the collector car marketplace for 2020, and I have a great guest that can help me do that. So I'd like to welcome Gord Duff. Gord, how are you doing today? I'm doing great. Thanks for uh, inviting me on. Yeah, I appreciate that. And for our listeners who don't know, Gord is the global head of auctions for RM Sotheby. So if anyone has his finger on the pulse of what's going out there in the collector car market, it is Gord. So Gord, I really appreciate it. I know I have a lot of stuff I want to ask you about just your history with RM, how you got into cars, your passion for cars. But before we start that, could you just kind of give me... I don't know, some broad thoughts you have on the market in general and specifically on all the craziness that went on in 2020. Yeah, I'm, I mean, I think everybody will agree that it was a, a interesting year um, um, for lots of different reasons. But obviously, you know, our business was uh, primarily based on doing uh, live auction events with lots of people in the room. And you know, thankfully, we got through, you know, Arizona and, and Paris and Amelia Island quite well. And, and it was right after Amelia Island that uh, everything shut down. And fortunate for us, we uh, had already been kind of dabbling a little bit in uh, selling vehicles and memorabilia online. And we were able to uh, switch over to that rather quickly. But, you know, honestly speaking, the, the market held up very well, I think. Prices were stable, and and you know the the great quality stuff still brought world record money, and and I think despite everything going on in the world, the market was very uh, strong. You know, you definitely didn't see what you typically do uh, at some of the live events throughout the auction company through the year. A lot of the you know million dollar plus cars were uh, uh, absent from that, but. You know, I think overall uh, uh, everything was was really strong. I have lots of friends that uh, uh, sell cars privately and and uh, do brokerage and and everything from the you know thirty thousand dollar cars you'd see uh, selling online to you know seven and eight figures uh, were being sold privately very well. And from the information I've been able to glean, it seems like the cars that did come to auction had some really strong sell-through rates, you know, maybe, I, I guess, I don't know about really strong, but on par with previous years. And even the price point was some held somewhat stable. It was just a lack of some volume of cars on the market. Is that correct? Yeah, that's what I'd say. I, I, I didn't see any price fluctuations throughout the year where, where things were down or, or, you know, people would say the market was soft. I didn't feel that at all. I, I thought things were holding up you know, really strong across the board. Yep, and I've had some previous guests that mentioned, you know, now they have more time to work on those cars in their garage they've always been wanting to do. So I'm sure some folks are having more time for the collector car hobby than maybe they had in the past. Definitely, you know, with with people being around home, they had a lot more time and, you know, a lot of the classic car events were canceled and rallies were canceled. And I think people just had, you know, more time to play with their own stuff uh, in their own uh, uh, hometowns. Yeah. Now, speaking of 2021, we are going back to live in Scottsdale, correct? We are. And I know everybody's excited about Amelia Island being live as well. Yeah. You know, I I, I think going into Arizona, we decided to put a little different spin on it, you know, not being at our typical place at the Arizona Biltmore, but um, I, I think what we've come up with is uh, interesting for us to try, and it, it gives a different perspective, and it lets people come for a full week of viewing if they just want to pop in or, or fly in to inspect a couple cars, and then perhaps uh, they'd rather go home and you know bid on the internet or, or bid over the telephone. But um, I think we've got a, a great offering of cars, honestly, and, and you know I, I think we've found a interesting way to present the auction, you know, under the current circumstances. Right, right. And speaking of which, I know there's a lot of other auction houses struggling with the same type of challenges RM has struggled with. Are there any trends or 
uh, innovative stuff you're seeing out there in the marketplace from other auction houses or some of these new online startups that you find interesting? Obviously, you know, in the last 10 months, we've seen a lot more companies uh, shift to online, whether they were live auctions that did the transition and as well as lots of other companies that, you know, decided to start an online auction. So I think there there's a lot of uh, places for people to choose from. And, and I think the players that had been in the online business for a while, their, their business just gained so much traction over the last, uh, you know, handful of months. They really grew from where they were, you know, a year ago. And, and even our company, from what we were dabbling in online to uh, the fact that we sold over $100 million worth of cars last year online, you know, I, I think ourselves, we advanced, you know, three to five years from where we would have been uh, had this uh, had COVID not happened, right? And yeah, it was very interesting because I remember seeing all the announcements. You know, new world record price for an online sale for I believe it was our first major online sale, not counting West Palm. And then that just was eclipsed like within an hour later, correct? And then it was eclipsed again for the Shift Monterey. Yeah, we were very fortunate when we went ahead and decided to do our first online auction uh, consignments and and we did a sale in May and and you know we were able to secure a, a Ferrari 288 GTO and an Enzo and and uh, the 288 brought you know the first world record for an online sale and you know within an hour we ended up selling the Enzo for even more and then during our, our Monterey sale we had the the 550 Pro drive that Uh, set a world record for uh, uh, a vehicle being sold online. I'm sure we'll see that eclipse this year in 2021. And one differentiating point I'd like to point out, at least for RM Sotheby's, is a lot of folks have confidence in the online process because of the big team of specialists that vet the cars, right, prior to them going onto the website? Yeah, that's right. I, I We have a very uh, loyal clientele. Lots of our specialists have very good relationships, and, you know, I, I think we put a lot of clients at ease that previously had never purchased something, you know, sight unseen online. So definitely our, our, our specialists and us having our eyes on the cars and being able to touch them and really look at them, you know, made made a big difference for our company and, and contributed to the success of uh, what we were able to achieve last year. Right. And I do remember seeing some of the numbers. It's just astounding the number of new bidders, not only to RM Sotheby's, but new online bidders. And it seemed like it opened up a global audience even more with the online aspect, correct? I think it was Definitely, you know, our reach was enhanced going online even further from what we were previously. And and also the fact that, you know, you had lots of people that, you know, were sitting at home for, you know, different parts of the year, especially when everything first shut down in March, April, May. Um, and, And I think that, you know, the fact that we've been in business for over four years and, you know, being in partnership with Sotheby's gave lots of people comfort. And then once they start looking at the cars and the fact they can ask uh, a, a real person as to additional questions. Have they seen the car? Have they driven the car? We gave clients a lot more uh, comfort in, in buying uh, over the computer. Was well, there anything else you'd like to mention as far as 2020 or going into 2021? You know, I'm happy that 2020 is, is behind us now. And, you know, I, <laughs> yep. I think we have a little bit of time before we're out of the woods, but I think a lot of advancements were accelerated, you know, for, for, you know, obviously a number of industries, but especially ours. And, and, you know, we worked really hard as a team and, and, you know, every day, week, month, we were, you know, constantly uh, um, adding to our, our platform and changing things to make it better for people to buy from us. And, and, uh, you know, I, I, I think under the circumstances, we did a great job and we'll just continue to, you know, innovate into 2021 and years to come. OK, no, that's awesome. And, you know, we met a number of times, uh, but I don't know you that well. So I'm really curious to find out a little bit about your personal passion for cars. I know looking from the outside in, being the global head of auctions for such a cool company as R.M. Sotheby's, that's a lot of guys dream jobs. So I know you don't walk in and just apply for this job and show them your resume. So if you would. Could you tell me a little bit of how you ended up where you are today? I'm born and raised in, in Chatham, Ontario, and that's where RM was you know, founded as a restoration facility. Obviously, as a kid, I knew of the company and, and you know, grew up around cars. My dad had a, a Ford dealership and then had a used car lot. And, you know, I used to go to lots of local shows with 
him and, and you know, check out all the cars and stuff like that. I, I knew lots about, or I knew of, you know, Corvettes and Mustangs and Thunderbirds, but, you know, I'd never seen a, a, a Duesenberg before or uh, even heard of one or a, a, a Packard or an Isada. And, and uh, it wasn't until I got a internship at RM through, my father knew somebody that ran our restoration shop at the time, and they were able to get me in for an internship, one of... Uh, I think it was my fourth year of high school. So I was able to get in and, and started uh, detailing cars, and, and that's kind of how it started and just never really left. Wow, that's really amazing. That's cool that you've not only been there for that long, but that you've been able to grow in your career and your expertise to achieve the level that you have at that company. That's really exciting. Well, can you give our listeners a little insight as far as what your day-to-day activities are? I know that's a big ask because I know it has changed a lot in the last year, but uh, in general, what your day-to-day tasks are as the global head? You know, my my main job is is vetting cars going into our auctions. So we have you know a team of uh, almost thirty specialists that that work for us you know throughout North America, and and you know we have a, a, a dozen people that work for us over in Europe. We have clients that have potential cars of interest to us, and and I basically vet to make sure that they're you know priced properly for the market and you know, verify histories and are the numbers matching and does it have its original body and, and just help curate our auctions throughout North America and Europe. And as well as doing that, I'm also, you know, I've got my own uh, client base and, and I can sign cars myself to our auctions. So I'm always searching and, and hunting for cars for a, a, a future auction and then finding clients that I know that, that are looking to buy specific cars. So, you know, our, our team not only has to consign the product or, or find the cars but you know when we get them consigned we need to go out and sell them well so you know it's a, a lot of work on on both sides of it yeah it sure is and i've gotten a little sneak peek of that and i do see what a a big effort it is to get high quality cars on the market in the right format it's just a quite an operation so it's been really cool to see it well, that's really cool. Now, what was the moment that you really got into cars? Was there a particular brand or model that you kind of fell in love with? I know when we were talking, I asked you kind of what was, I always thought of you as kind of like the pre-war guy. You know, you, you knew a lot about the Packers and the Duesenbergs, but then when I asked you what's in your garage, you had something totally different, which kind of threw me a little bit. So if you would kind of tell me, what do you kind of gravitate towards? You know, I started with RM when I was 18 years old. I think that, you know, throughout the years, I, I obviously grew up around our shop and we were well known for uh, restoring pre-war American and European classics. So I think by default, I just started appreciating different uh, Cadillacs from the 30s, Packards, Duesenbergs. We were just, I was around them all the time. I was driving them. I used to transport cars for our company and, and within the realm of those brands, then I started realizing which ones were, you know, more attractive or more special or noticing different features, and that kind of just kept refining um, my uh, taste a little bit. But the beauty of our company is we, you know, sell every brand and era of car. So I definitely like American classics, but, you know, I've, I've consigned and sold and driven lots of, you know, 60s Ferraris and, and you know, 300 SLs and muscle cars. And, you know, I, I have a, a broad range of tastes and interests, I guess. I, I wouldn't really narrow it down into uh, uh, one particular area, but if I uh, won the lottery, I would be dangerous going out and buying cars because I, <laughs> I think I could put together a, a great personal collection from everything that you know I've been able to be a part of selling and, and touching and consigning and driving. So if you did win the lottery, what would be the first purchase? Um, probably on the American side would be a... a, a Duesenberg Murphy Roadster, like a disappearing top Murphy Roadster, maybe something a little even more special than that, but that would probably be the first thing I'd go out and buy. Okay. How about on the European side? It's kind of a toss-up. I've always loved the Lusso, you know, so it would probably be a Lusso or a 275 GTB of some variant. I think, you know, super iconic cars, and, and I think one of those would definitely be in my garage, you know, next to the Duesenberg, and then, you know, from there I'd, I, I, I could – find lots of other things, but those would probably be the first two things that I'd go out and buy. Yeah. Okay. Well, if you don't mind telling us, what is in your garage today? I have a 66 Shelby GT350 that I've had for 
I want to say probably 10 years now. It means a lot to me under the circumstances of how I was, you know, able to uh, acquire the car, and, and it turned out to be very cool history-wise, the fact that, you know, the car was sold new an hour away from where I live and spent its entire life in Windsor, Ontario. So we've probably sold hundreds of Shelbys over the years, and I don't know if I've seen any other ones that have been sold close to where I'm from. So it was just coincidence that this car came up and it happened to be an hour away. And, you know, it's the car in my garage that no matter what else I own, it'll, you know, I'll never sell this particular car for a few different reasons. So that's one I've had the longest. I've done the Copper State Rally in it five or six times. I've driven it out to LA to our office from there. I've, I've probably done, you know, 20, 30,000 miles in the car since I've owned it. And, you know, I probably owe that to my colleague, Donnie Gould, who's had a 66 Hertz car since 19, I think it was 1980. Um, wow. And I remember seeing that car, you know, when I first started out and I'd go down to Florida and he had it in a warehouse and, you know, I just didn't know much about them. I always dreamed of owning a, you know, a 68 or an Eleanor. I remember gone in 60 seconds before I started, you know, with the company and I thought that was a cool movie at the time, obviously. And, and uh, somehow I got transitioned into, um, you know, the, the, first generation, so to speak, of Shelby's. Yeah, I, I think Donnie has a lot to do with me, you know, owning that car today. Right, right. Now, what's next to it? Because I find this kind of interesting. I've been fortunate, and, and last year I, I actually bought a 2015 GT350. Uh, I always thought it would be kind of cool to have uh, a new with the old, and I had a friend of mine when they first came out in 15 that, that came to pick me up for dinner one night when we were at the Scottsdale auction and I just, you know, I thought it was an amazing car and, and, you know, in terms of value for what you get, you know, compared to buying a, a brand new Porsche or a Ferrari and, and the fact that the maintenance on it is a, you know, $100 oil change and it's not a $10,000 <laughs> right. engine out service, you know, makes a difference. But, you know, my 66 is white with blue stripes and, you know, this car is white with blue stripes and I bought it off a good you know, client of ours, buddy of mine. So it's, it's kind of neat that, um, you know, where I got the car from and, and, uh, um, it's just, it's, it's everything the old car is, but with air conditioning, power steering and a nice stereo. It's great to see the two side by side of it. And that's actually not the one I was referencing. I didn't know you had that one. Isn't there an 87 car of some sort in there as well? I, I also have, I, I had a thing <laughs> for about five years looking for, uh, a Porsche 930 turbo. I, I, kind of fell in love with those a while back and you know I used to go on probably Hemmings was the easiest app on my phone you know that you know at nights I would kind of go through and just see what was up there and and uh, um, I came across an 81 that um, it's a 930 turbo but it was sent to roof in 1987 and converted to BTR so it has the bigger engine and turbo and a five speed in it and it's got a tartan interior and and uh it belonged to a friend of mine that um, ended up passing away, but I had never seen the car the whole time that I knew him. And, you know, after he passed, I looked after selling the cars off and um, I kind of fell in love and, and started understanding more about the roofs kind of right before this car came up. So, um, you know, it was a, a fortunate opportunity and I was uh, uh, able to get that one as well. And, and, you know, I'm learning lots about it and learning that, you know, there's lots of gremlins and issues with cars from the 80s i always thought it was you know cars from the 60s and 30s but you know you can uh, uh fix just as many things on a you know young timers era car as you can on the old ones but I'm, I'm getting it all sorted out and you know it's it's been a fun experience learning you know more about the car yeah that's funny because i remember when we first met uh you, you mentioned the 66 shelby when i asked you and then you mentioned the 911 and i thought well that's funny because i just sold my 66 Mustang convertible, nowhere near the level of a GT350, but it was still a pretty cool car. And I sold it to buy a 911, a 996 911, so I thought that was kind of a small world kind of moment. So, I, yeah. I had a, a friend customer of ours out in Vancouver that collected Tartan Interior 930s, and I remember going to visit him, and at that time he had five or six of them. And I, that might have been the first time I really noticed about the different interiors that Porsche did in cars, you know, throughout the 70s and 80s. And I just kind of fell in love with it. And I thought, if I'm ever going to own one of these, I need to find one that's got 
tartan interior in it and uh, you know this one just by luck happened to come up and it was in Michigan and you know it all worked out and uh, never thought I'd own another white car it happens to be white but um, you know it's 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 a cool thing and and you know buying and owning cars that's the best way to learn about them you know you can read all you want about a specific car and you know books and online but it's not until you own them that you really fully understand you know what they're all about and you know what makes them cool and what faults they have and you know what issues that they all seem to have that need sorting when you buy them and and that kind of stuff so it's 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 been really cool yeah i've gone through that with my 996 because i have replaced the ims bearing the clutch the starter you know all the the six things that are wrong with those cars <laughs> i figured it out and got them fixed so yeah you're right you definitely have a stronger bond with the car when you do some of it yourself or go through that process. So that's really cool. Yeah. And, and all these cars, you know, you got to buy them and, and drive them and, and keep tweaking stuff to get them sorted out. You know, it, it, it doesn't matter if the car was fully restored, you know, last year or if it's been, you know, 30 years since it's been restored, they always need, they always need constant work, but you know, the more you drive them, the more you dial them in and, and the more uh, reliable they get, you know, to the fact that, you know, my 66 Shelby, I mean, I've never been broken down on the side of the road after I sorted the car out and I've put lots and lots of miles on it. And it's, you know, just as reliable as, you know, my daily driver. Yeah, that's really awesome. Well, one question I forgot to ask you is what car would you buy for 30 grand or less? 30 grand? Yeah. Hmm. Oh, I stumped you. All right. I like that. <laughs> uh... I'd have to think on that for a bit. I'm, 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 I'd, I'd love a, a, you know, I have uh, three small children, two boys and a little girl, and I have a fascination with station wagons. Uh-oh. So <laughs> I always thought it would be cool to buy a, you know, nine passenger with a flip up rear seat and, you know, something from the, probably in the seventies era, you know, a, yep. a, a Ford perhaps. And, and, uh, uh, I look at those on, you know, some of the online sites and, you know, those, those used to be vehicles that were, nobody cared about them. They were, you know, five grand, eight grand, 10 grand. And, you know, now I think you're probably even hard pressed to find like a really nice one for, you know, maybe somewhere in the 30 to 40 range, you know, and it, it's hard to pull the trigger on buying a station wagon for that kind of money. But I just think it would be a cute thing to own, you know, as my kids are getting older and, you know, have this weird sensation or dream to go put a Christmas tree on the roof one winter and, you know, use it as a, a, a summer car to drive around in. But I'm sure after I got in it and the air conditioning didn't work and it's hot inside the car and, um, <laughs> you know, I, I, I might quickly change my mind. But that's something I pay attention to and I like, you know, following along and, and looking at our, you know, station wagons. Whenever I, I see one of those with my wife, she just always comments about riding in it when she was little, the back, you know, the backward seat looking out the back. Uh, that's a really cool memory. I did the same thing, and, and I it's probably cooler for me to think about it than it is to actually own it and be driving it, but I think I might need to own one someday for a little bit just to kind of uh, get it out of my system. You know, and I think it would be a fun thing to have with the kids for you know, a few summers and, and then, you know, move on and go into something else. Yeah. When I sat in the back, I got nauseous. So I, I moved back <laughs> up front. So, right. Uh, all right. Well, uh, the last thing I like to do at the end is a little game. I did give you a heads up about called keep cash and crush. So I will give you three cars and you have to tell me which one you want to keep forever, which one you will cash in and then which one you're going to send to the crusher. Uh, so let's see, because I wasn't a hundred percent dialed in on your taste, I picked three different cars from three different eras and, uh, hopefully it'll make it tough on you. My last few people were, I was pretty easy on them without, I wasn't purposely easy on them, but they had the answers pretty quick. So hopefully you'll, uh, you'll struggle here. So the first one is a 1933 Packard eight Cabriolet. Now I will say these are all cars that are coming up for sale at our Scottsdale auction. So you are. You probably okay. vetted these at some point. So a 1933 <laughs> Packard 8 Cabriolet, a 1961 Jag E-Type Series 1, and then the newest one, a 1990 Mercedes-Benz 190E 2.5 Evo 2. So those are your three cars, the 1933 Packard, the 61 Jag E-Type, and the 1990 Mercedes-Benz. Which one would you keep forever? Which one will you cash in? And which one will you crush? 
Um, my this will probably throw you off, and it it goes against what I just talked about with my love for cars. But honestly, <laughs> I'd, I'd keep the Evo. <laughs> I would sell the Jag, and and uh, I hate to say it, but I'd I'd uh, I'd crush the Packard, I guess. <laughs> that that's probably exact opposite of the way I thought yeah. you would have picked. <laughs> yeah. All right. So explain uh, your logic. The young timer era of cars have obviously gotten super hot in the last couple of years, and you know, if you asked me 24 months ago, what do I know about that era of car? It was probably very little, but. In our business, you know, we consign cars, and from consigning cars, you really get to know them. And, you know, I, I consigned, when we came out with the Young Timers collection, uh, I think two years ago, it was, it ended up being over 200 cars that were in Switzerland, and it was all Mercedes and, uh, you know, Bentley, Porsche, all that kind of stuff, all different eras, but multiples of the same thing. And, and, you know, I started paying attention to those Evos as they came up, and I just think they're a super cool car, and I think they've got long legs for for interest from the new generation of collector, and obviously they're pulling, you know, huge money now compared to probably what they were five years ago because a lot of people didn't know about them. So I just, I personally think that that would be a cool car to, to own for a while. You know, okay. I, I guess keep forever. You know, the the... The Jaguar, I really like them. They're a very common car, so I, I think it's one of those things that if I were to ever sell one, I can always go find another one. I can always go find the color that I you know, might have had or the year that I might have had. If you're patient, you can find exactly what you're looking for when it comes to an E-Type because there's just, they're always out there for sale. They're, they're you know, very common at our auctions, obviously in different conditions and and, and paint colors, but if you're patient, you can find exactly what you're looking for. It wouldn't be a hold for me. And and the Packard, uh, you know, I love Packards. I guess the that's not my favorite body style, and because of the three cars you told me that I was allowed <laughs> to choose from, that just right. happens to be the, the, the one that I wouldn't, you know, be interested in owning. Right, okay. Well, that's fair. Is it, was it too easy, or was it, did you have to think a little bit? No, it was it was it was pretty easy. I, I think when it comes to classics, I've got very specific taste on on just from being around it of what I really really love and and you know what's more of a common car. So I'm I'm very into a narrow market when it comes to you know my dream uh, American classics because I've just I've been able to see the the best of the best. So that's kind of you know where I get drawn to. Well, my next guest is going to be Barney to help cover some of the cars coming up for Scottsdale, so I'm going to make it really tough on him. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, thanks so much, Gord, for your time today. What's the best way for our listeners to learn more about RM? Honestly, just go on our website. I mean, you can learn about our, our specialists and, and, you know, the different backgrounds that our guys have, and there's lots of history on our, our company, and we're rare in the fact that, you know, we started as a, a restoration facility, and then we got into buying and selling cars, and then got in the auction business, so I think we have a very well-rounded team and, and a very passionate team that loves specific makes and models, and, you know, we know the restoration process as well, so I think that helps us look, you know, deep into cars to to know them as best as possible and and you know the the good and the bad about all of them yeah definitely some expert eyes covering all those things so awesome well thanks for your time today man i really appreciate it okay all right no problem greg thanks for having me thanks for listening to the collector car podcast don't forget to give us a nice rating on itunes and be sure to follow us on instagram and everywhere else at the collector car podcast 